first Yates lecture, I, I uh, was talking about uh, Yates's early development and, and stylistic transformation uh, over the course of uh, oh, oh, roughly a uh, 20, 25 year period. Yates has a long career, you know, really beginning. Uh, 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 in the uh, you know late 19th century, and when when we the 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 poems that, that matter the most to us today uh, are those that he starts publishing around 1915 uh, uh, or 1914 uh, and and later, uh, but uh, you know he's in really the middle of his his um, uh, uh, literary career at that point. Um, I, I suggested in, in looking at that early development um, that uh, uh, well, Yeats is, is seen as a kind of representative figure who somehow uh, moves out of um, uh, symbolism, uh, out of a kind of uh, uh, ornate aestheticism towards uh, a kind of heroic realism. Uh, but I, I insisted instead that, in fact, the, the, the way to, to understand that development is, is really a transition from one set of symbols to another, uh, uh, as exemplified by um, the, the movement between uh, uh, Angus and uh, the fishermen in, in Yeats's uh, early work. Um, uh, the uh, little poem, A Coat, uh, that poem about that stylistic transformation, um, <coughs> about the, the enterprise of walking naked, uh, well, uh, it's, it's a poem that, that reminds us that Yeats's development was, as he understood it, conditioned by his relationship to his audience. <coughs> uh, Yeats, I said, wanted to speak for and to the Irish people. Uh, <coughs> as well as uh, to explain uh, uh, Ireland and Irishness to an English-speaking uh, world uh, abroad. <coughs> At the same time, uh, even as he has a, a kind of intense uh, identification uh, with the Irish people, uh, he also, in that little poem and in other poems, Fears being betrayed by the crowd, uh, fears being sold cheap, uh, <laughs> complains of, of uh, uh, complains of his re reception. <coughs> Last time I uh, alluded to Yeats's involvement in uh, the Abbey Theater, uh, beginning in 1904. This is an important phase of his career, when, with the help of Lady Augusta Gregory uh, and John Singh. Uh, Yeats uh, tries to establish an Irish national drama. Uh, Singh's play, The Playboy of the Western World, which you may know, uh, it was set in the uh, Aran Islands uh, in, in Western Ireland. Uh, this was a, a kind of turning point uh, in the movement, <coughs> Under, misunderstood uh, as, a, as a satire on the Irish peasantry. Uh, Yeats' uh, production of the play uh, led to riots in, in 1909. This is one of the uh, uh, events, uh, I think, that Yeats is uh, thinking about in The Fisherman when he speaks of great art beaten down. Uh, the audience that Yeats uh, disdains and turns away from in the teens uh, is uh, importantly a, a, a middle class urban audience, <coughs> um, and and that that attitude of Yeats's uh, it's it's a motif uh, we find uh, uh, in other poets that we'll read, and I uh, uh, I'd like you to to uh, um, note it uh, an attitude that we'll see in Pound uh, in Eliot in in different ways. <coughs> the displacement of uh, aris aristocratic and peasant cultures by uh, an urban uh, bourgeoisie, uh, by, that, by the Dublin theater-going audience, the, the, uh, the people at the center of a, a new uh, 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 mongrel uh, modern culture, 
Uh, well, these are the people that Joyce uh, depicts so uh, memorably uh, in the daily life of Leopold Bloom. <coughs> uh, Yeats is a very different writer and has a different relation to the world of Joyce's Ulysses, for example. Uh, Yeats has a, has a kind of hostility uh, towards this uh, ascendant uh, middle class world and a hostility that you can view as a kind of anti-modernism <coughs> uh, or anti-modernness <coughs> uh, that is, again, an important component in Yeats. Uh, or, or maybe the right way to say it would be that Yeats's sense of his own modernity, of what it means for him to be modern, uh, emerges in, in um, uh, defiance of uh, certain uh, uh, new uh, uh, social formations uh, and also through a fantasy, I say, uh, identification with the aristocracy and with the peasantry, uh, with these cultures rooted in uh, rural Irish society of the past. <coughs> like Pound, uh, like Eliot, uh, from a political and uh, social point of view, you could say that Yeats is a reactionary modernist, uh, turning away from the ascendant social forms uh, of the present towards an idealized past. Or, rather, you could say Yeats seems to want to do this, seems to want to turn away from the present, uh, expresses the desire to. In fact, however, uh, Yeats's eyes remain really fixed in, in the kind of horror and fascination on the uh, cataclysmic events of his time, <coughs> on the political life of his time, in which he is himself very much involved. Uh, Yeats is, uh, in fact, uh, a far less nostalgic thinker than either Eliot or pound, at least as I understand him. Uh, the, the stance that I'm, I'm trying to describe, which is a kind of ambivalent and complicated one, uh, emerges uh, powerfully uh, in, in the poem Easter 1916 uh, uh, on page 105 in, in this book. And I'd like to spend some time with that with you. Easter 1916, uh, the subject of this poem is the Easter Uprising. The Irish Republican challenge to English domination that briefly established an Irish state that led by Patrick uh, Pierce, uh, who uh, along with, uh, in fact, all but one of the leaders of the insurrection was executed. Uh, th these events have a, you know, still have a, a kind of central and powerful place in, in modern Irish consciousness. If you, you go to Dublin and you enter the post office, the, one of the important scenes of the uh, rebellion, uh, you, you find great uh, wall paintings uh, of scenes from, uh, from the, the Rising, uh, almost like you know, Stations of the Cross. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, well, Dublin is an interesting place to be with this poem in mind, uh, partly because you, you realize uh, when you were there that, that it's, the city center is a small one uh, and that um, well, Yeats's house is, was not far from uh, the post office uh, and uh, the um, uh, world that he's uh, writing about uh, is something uh, very uh, intimate uh, and familiar uh, of which he is a part. Uh, and that is, in fact, one of the important points of departure for this poem. He says, I have met them at close of day coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among gray 18th century houses. Dublin. 
them being the revolutionaries. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite, meaningless words, or I've lingered a while and said polite, meaningless words, and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn, all changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Motley signifying their Irishness, as if Yeats and, and these men and women he speaks of shared only their Irishness. In the second strophe of this poem, he, he proceeds to talk about, to isolate individuals, uh, particular uh, uh, figures uh, of the revolt, which uh, uh, your uh, editor identifies at the bottom of the page. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. <coughs> what voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to harriers? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vainglorious lout, he had done most bitter wrong to some who were near my heart, Maud Gunn, yet I number him in the song. He, too, has resigned his part He in the casual comedy. He, too, has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Yeats is, is describing his interaction with uh, uh, and his distance from uh, Peirce uh, and the others in that first stanza and then in the second. He's saying something like, uh, I used to see these people all the time. Uh, I was proud, however. I kept myself apart from them. I felt we had nothing in common but motley. Uh, our Irishness. <coughs> but all that is changed by events. They have become political martyrs to the future Irish state, and I am obliged to remember and honor them in my poetry. Even those I disdained, my poetry, uh, which, well, the dedication to which had defined Yeats's difference from them up till now. The poem's extraordinary refrain, A Terrible Beauty is Born, uh, it returns in the poem like a, a, uh, like a chorus, uh, like the voice of some kind of abstract and impersonal chorus. Uh, and it, it um, suggests a, a, almost a, a strangely impersonal event, something uh, that, that happens uh, without agents making it happen. A terrible beauty is born, a passive construction. <coughs> uh, take the first part of the refrain first, all changed, changed utterly. All changed, changed utterly. I think there's really three strong metrical accents in a row there. Uh, by all, that three letter word, uh, a, a highly Yeatsian word, a word Yeats loves to use. You'll, you'll see him uh, uh, use it often. Yeats means all of them, all of those people, all the people I've been describing. 
He also means uh, my relation to them, the way I kept myself apart from them. Uh, he also means all, uh, everything, plain and simple, all in the sense of everyone and everything, all conveying a kind of apocalyptic, epical event. That wonderful pileup of stress uh, in that line, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Another two, two strong three-beat lines in a row, they become a kind of, well, what, uh, bell uh, ringing uh, in the poem, uh, pealing uh, and, and uh, 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 announcing the coming, uh, uh, the birth of a new and terrible age. How can something be changed utterly? Uh, it's, it's, how, can, how can something be changed utterly? Uh, doesn't that mean destroyed? Uh, to be entirely changed? Uh, Yeats is, is talking about uh, an event that has brought forth uh, destruction. <coughs> Uh, destruction of the world before the Easter uprising, uh, and, and Easter is an important resonance here, obviously. Uh, Easter, another moment uh, of death and transfiguration, trans transformation. Uh, here, uh, this destruction brings forth a new order, a new form of life that Yeats calls terrible beauty. Uh, this may be the most uh, memorable uh, sentence in modern poetry, <coughs> a terrible beauty is born. Uh, I said that, that Yeats looks on uh, uh, the modern uh, with a sense of both horror and, and of fascination, of, of compulsion uh, almost. Uh, well, uh, it's a terrible beauty he sees that, that, that draws him uh, in this way. <coughs> he sees the specifically the passion of the revolutionaries act, and he finds it beautiful. Yeats aestheticizes their political action. He finds beauty in it. It seems even or especially because it is terror-filled when the change uh, that it enacts is utter, uh, which is to say, uh, a change that means blood. <coughs> to find bloody events beautiful, what do you think about that? How do you, how do, how do you describe the, the, uh, the politics, uh, if you like, uh, of, of such a position? Uh, well, how does Yeats stand in relation to the events he's describing. Easter 1916 equivocates. <coughs> uh, like that phrase, terrible beauty, uh, the poem is full of contradictions, of contradictory feelings. It takes the side of the nationalists. It also makes the anti-nationalist, the English or pro-English or unionist case. It sees the dead as heroic martyrs. Uh, it also sees them as uh, uh, ideologues, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, stony-hearted <coughs> uh, um, uh, uh, political activists. Uh, it sees the dead as lovers, too. Uh, it sees them as dreamers. Uh, Yeats looks at them with pity, uh, with admiration, with scorn. Uh, he speaks of them as a mother would of her children. Uh, all of these attitudes, and others too, are, are, uh, are held in suspension in the poem. And, and, uh, 
you can hear them together. Uh, Yeats moving from one to another uh, with, oh, uh, 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 incredible speed and agility in that final strophe of the poem on the, the next page. Listen to, uh, to how quickly Yeats modulates from one, one feeling, uh, one image, uh, uh, to another in these really very short, uh, quick three-beat lines. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part. Our part to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child, when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, 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 not night, but death. Was it needless death, after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride, and Connolly and Purse, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Uh, this is really moving poetry, uh, you know, remarkably so. Uh, and that may be the most important fact about it. Uh, when Yeats aestheticizes the political, uh, he makes it moving. Uh, moving in the literal sense of, uh, I think, emotionally engaging and cathartic. Uh, he can specifically converts the political into tragic action. Tragic action which, as spectators, uh, the poet and the reader, ourselves, uh, are meant to be passionately and imaginatively engaged, uh, which is also to say implicated. Uh, through Yeats's poem, uh, Easter 1916 goes on happening, uh, happening uh, in a sense uh, uh, in and, 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 and even to us. <coughs> the poem makes us see the political as a space of passion and of contradictions like art. Uh, and it requires us to understand history not in moral terms, uh, such as good and evil, but rather in aesthetic terms. Uh, pity and terror, these become crucial terms, uh, the terms that uh, Aristotle in his poetics used to define tragedy. Uh, when, the, when the bombs uh, went off in, in London last year, uh, I thought about Yeats and, 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 and uh, what he might have thought or written about this. As I, as I said last time when I showed you that letter to Pound, his, uh, uh, Yeats's um, London apartment uh, is essentially across the street from where the number 30 bus blew up. Uh, and interestingly, uh, strangely, make of it what you will, the uh, man who uh, uh, detonated that uh, bomb, uh, as I understand it, uh, had studied Yeats uh, at school in, in Leeds. Uh, there's, a, there's a way in which Yeats's poetry of this period uh, goes on resonating in, in uh, the world we're, we're living in. Yeats's, Yeats's sense of his own implication in, in history, uh, well, it's something that we see in the uh, intensive stylistic transformations that his writing undergoes. Uh, part of the, the resonance and power of that famous refrain, a terrible beauty is born, uh, is that this beauty is being born not only in the world, but in Yeats's poetry. <coughs> uh, something remarkable is happening uh, to uh, the poet uh, and to uh, his, his language uh, at the same time. <coughs> uh, 
uh, Yeats is saying, even simply, on one level, I will write differently henceforth. I must. Uh, Yeats's stylistic changes in this way are coordinated with, respond to, the historical changes he witnesses and participates in, uh, in particular, uh, uh, coordinated with the violent uh, emergence of, uh, through civil war, of, of the Irish state, which Yeats would serve uh, as a senator uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Yeats, in this period, makes and remakes his work out of passion, uh, a sort of, as he images it, tumult uh, in the breast. Uh, 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 a uh, uh, tumult from which new modes of poetry, new modes of self-knowledge uh, emerge for Yeats. Yeats's poetry is full of images of birth, uh, and he tends to represent birth as an explosion, uh, a bursting forth. Uh, a bursting forth of, of energy uh, or presence, uh, in some sense, that can't be contained or constrained in existing forms. <coughs> uh, I'll, say, I'll say more about this uh, next time with reference to Yeats's late poetry. Uh, what I want to stress now is that Yeats sees passion at work uh, in the same way in history. <coughs> Uh, powerful superhuman forces emerge from or invade uh, human actors and change them. Uh, one consequence of this view is that for Yeats, uh, history starts to look like a poem, uh, or uh, it starts to conform to laws of poetic imagination or of tragedy, if, if you like. <coughs> uh, of myth, uh, it uh, well uh, in the Easter Rising, uh, Peirce and the others for Yeats uh, invoke uh, as as they the revolutionaries themselves deliberately and rhetorically did uh, invoke ancient Irish heroes. Uh, uh, Peirce. Uh, is seen as, in Yeats's poetry and in popular lore, as Cuchulain, as a kind of avatar of, of uh, um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, mythic Irish hero. Uh, at the same time uh, as the superhuman enters these historical characters in this way, uh, there's also uh, well, um, uh, um, an energy that you would have to call subhuman, uh, bestial, uh, that does uh, as well. Uh, in his late poem, uh, The Statues, which you don't have, Yeats says, uh, um, uh, um, what, uh, when, when um, uh, Peirce uh, summoned Cuchulain to his side, uh, what stalked through the post office? Uh, as if uh, the revolutionary's action um, uh, brought forth at once uh, the presence of a legendary hero and a beast that might uh, be stalking uh, through his, his embodiment and his presence. Yeats saw history in, in symbolic and mystical terms. Uh, this is a poet who, uh, with his wife, practiced automatic writing, <coughs> who believed that the dead spoke through the living. This, this uh, occult Yeats is, is a uh, genuinely and wonderfully strange thinker. Uh, he elaborated a systematic account of mind and history. Uh, as, as I said last time, talking about the Song of Wandering Angus uh, and, and Yeats's interest in alchemy, which was developed. Uh, it isn't, in fact, necessary for you to grasp Yeats's system, which you'd have to go to his uh, book called A Vision uh, to begin to do. It isn't necessary uh, for you to uh, grasp his occultism in order to uh, read his poetry uh, well. 
<coughs> uh, Yeats said that the, the voices that he communicated with uh, on the other side gave him uh, metaphors for poetry. This is what they, this is what they deliver him. Uh, they, they also gave him, as he put it, stylistic arrangements of experience. Uh, this, the, the occult gives Yeats aesthetic forms for understanding um, individual psychology and historical event. This is, I think, uh, how we need to understand uh, the, uh, the various occult symbols uh, in, in uh, another great uh, poem uh, from uh, this phase in his career, a little bit further on, The Second Coming, uh, on page 111. <coughs> Uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born? Another poem of birth. Uh, notice how very casual Yeats is in that second strophe, how self-consciously fantastic and speculative he is. He doesn't insist that the apocalypse is at hand, only that some revelation is. Uh, in fact, uh, this poem's power uh, lies, I think, in its, uh, not only its inability, but its unwillingness to specify the content of that revelation. Uh, Yeats suggests that we think of this historical moment <coughs> as the second coming. But this is not the return of Jesus that Christianity prophesizes. Uh, Yeats sees the second coming as an image. Uh, as a myth, an idea, a metaphor, a certain stylistic arrangement of experience. It comes out of what he calls spiritus mundi, <laughs> a kind of semi-technical term. Uh, Yeats's name for something like the collective unconscious of all peoples, a kind of repertoire of, of archetypes uh, from which the symbols that we use to understand the world derive. Uh, it is, uh, um, this is, this is <laughs> Well, this is really, a, I, I think, a, a, a radical, if not heretical, idea for the national poet of a Christian people. Uh, Yeats is saying that Christianity is only one symbolic order among others. It has a history. Uh, it is now passing away as it once came into being. He's also saying that the birth of Christ in Bethlehem was a nightmare for the world it altered <coughs> the world that it changed utterly, a change that Yeats sees as the end now of the Christian era and not its fulfillment. There is, isn't there too, the disturbing suggestion that Christ himself was a rough beast? Uh, Yeats 
develops this idea or develops another version of it in a somewhat earlier poem uh, that's interesting in relation to this one. And, and let's, let's turn back and look at it uh, on page 103. Uh, that's the Magi. Um, uh, again, a, a visionary poem uh, where Yeats is saying, uh, I see, I see in my mind's eye. This is, this is the action of the poem takes place in Yeats's imagination. Now, as at all times, I can see in the mind's eye, in their stiff painted clothes, the pale unsatisfied ones appear and disappear in the blue depth of the sky with all their ancient faces like rain-beaten stones in all their helms of silver hovering side by side, in all their eyes still fixed, hoping to find once more, being by Calvary's turbulence unsatisfied, the uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor. Uh, the Magi here are again a, an image, a kind of visionary symbol. Uh, an image available in the mind's eye at all times. Uh, they are unsatisfied by Calvary's turbulence. <laughs> Calvary's turbulence. Uh, a remarkable phrase. Uh, unsatisfied by the scene of Christian martyrdom. Uh, because they recognize that history is cyclical, uh, and that the cycle that they saw come into being can only be completed by another such birth, uh, not by Christ's death and resurrection. <coughs> uh, notice here how uh, uh, Yeats images what is at the core of Christ's birth. Uh, it is an uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor, uh, on the floor, uh, on the bottom, uh, on the ground, uh, where the animals dwell. Uh, the second coming, uh, it seems, is, a, is um, as Yeats imagines it, a kind of similarly uncontrollable mystery. And the, the, uh, the energy uh, the, the new presence that it releases into the world uh, is bestial, uh, is that of a beast. The, uh, the divine enters the human in these poems of Yeats uh, through the bestial. It's a powerful and disturbing idea. Uh, there's a, a Another very powerful and disturbing poem uh, that literalizes this idea, uh, and that is Leda and the Swan <coughs> on page 118. A, uh, a poem that is a sonnet, though it doesn't quite look like it at first. <coughs> uh, a mythological poem. <coughs> Uh, that <coughs> seeks to give a mythological image to or for the kinds of epical and apocalyptic historical change that uh, Yeats is living through uh, in the 1920s in Ireland. <coughs> Uh, it's a, it's a, in certain ways, it's a, it's a beautiful poem and a grotesque one uh, at the same time. A sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified, vague fingers push 
the feathered glory from her loosening thighs. And how can body, laid in that white rush, but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop? History, what makes history happen, is imaged here in the form of the rape of the human by the divine in the form of a beast, the form of a swan. Uh, the myth that Yeats takes up is uh, of Zeus's rape of, of the maiden Leda, uh, whom he attacks uh, as a swan. Uh, the offspring that the rape engender uh, includes Helen, the terrible beauty for whom the Trojan War was fought. Uh, also, Clyt Clytemnestra, uh, the wife of the Greek lord Agamemnon, whom Clytemnestra murders on his return from Troy. Uh, those future events are, are, uh, are, are glimpsed <laughs> in the, in, in the uh, sestet of this poem, in the final six lines. Uh, they are, in a sense, uh, uh, compressed and imaged and contained in the rape itself. <coughs> uh, there's, a, there's a kind of radical foreshortening of, of temporal experience at uh, what uh, Yeats images as the orgasmic union of the divine and human, a shudder in the loins, uh, bringing about the sack of Troy, uh, the murder of the king, uh, all that future contained in this uh, generative, ambiguous violence uh, in the presence that the poem describes, the present that the poem describes. Uh, in, in effect, in the, that middle part of the poem, uh, Yeats collapses creation and destruction. Uh, suggesting that the same bestial energy uh, flows through uh, both of these acts. Uh, here, uh, divine force reduces to brute power uh, in somewhat the same way as it does in the Magi and the Second Coming. <coughs> Uh, one result of this is, is Yeats's, and this is interesting, his, his lack of interest uh, in the God. This isn't a poem about Zeus. <laughs> it's not a poem about the swan. <coughs> uh, he doesn't name the swan, uh, just as he doesn't name the rough beast uh, in, in the second coming. Uh, what the swan thinks or feels or intends doesn't matter. Uh, the swan is really only a, a force. And Yeats's concern is rather with the human experience of that force, uh, which is, again, another uh, manifestation of terrible beauty. Uh, Yeats explores that experience, uh, which is an experience of suffering here and a violation, uh, through a series of rhetorical questions, uh, which are a crucial poetic device for Yeats. Uh, Yeats is a poet who asks questions. Questions, well, they're different. Even rhetorical questions are different, aren't they, from statements of fact. They're more like uh, propositions, like speculations uh, that we're asked to test through empathic identification with, in this case, uh, the poem's subject, Lita. Uh, this, this, is, this is what the form of the question invites, I think. Uh, in Easter 1916, I talked about Yeats's partial, complicated identification with the suffering 
martyrs uh, of that poem. Uh, well, that identification here is reimagined, and we're invited into it too, troublingly, I think. Uh, the frightening uh, experience that Yeats uh, evokes here is the imposition of the divine on the human. Uh, helpless breast on breast. Uh, it's a, that's a wonderful phrase. The repetition of breast links them, uh, makes us see them together, side by side, one on top of the other. It even, I think, identifies the divine and the human, makes them hard to tell apart, uh, binds them, uh, even while we are being confronted with their difference. Uh, Lita feels the beating of the swan's heart, and that heart is strange to her, that simple, powerful word. The poem's uh, great final question uh, concerns that perception. Did she put on his knowledge with his power? Did she know the heart she felt, or could she only feel it? Uh, what difference would it make between those two things? Between knowing that heart and merely feeling it? Uh, it's the difference between uh, knowing uh, history, understanding its patterns and motivating forces, its causes, intentions, and merely feeling it, merely suffering it, uh, serving as its instrument or vessel, an object to be dropped when it's no longer useful. <coughs> uh, to know history, to be able to, to put on the God's knowledge with his power, uh, would be to have access to history's meaning, uh, and therefore to be more than merely subject to it, subject to its capricious and, and uh, violating uh, forces. Uh, but Yeats doesn't answer the question, does he? Uh, well, uh, why not? Probably because there isn't an answer. Uh, the further implication uh, is, I think, that um, whether or not we can have access to historical knowledge, the only path to such knowledge is through submission to its bestial or brute power which is a kind of shattering experience in this poem. Uh, well, on, on Monday we'll, we'll look at some of the figures in Yeats's late poems uh, who represent a kind of knowledge to be had through uh, an experience of, well, violation uh, or of shattering power. Uh, characters such as the mad old men uh, or uh, uh, Crazy Jane uh, in Yeats's late poems. <coughs>